Today, we're going to talk to legendary photojournalist Gary Hirshhorn about what I would call one of his most iconic images. It's a photo from the 2008 Obama election night rally on Behind the Shot. Hi, welcome to Behind the Shot. I'm Steve Brazel. This is the show where we try and get inside the mind of a great photographer by taking a closer look behind one of their shots. From conception to completion, all those stories and challenges that happen in between. As always, this show and every show that I do, you can find the show notes over at BehindTheShot.tv. And of course, if you're watching on YouTube, the uh, show notes are also down. All the links that we mentioned, those are all down in the show notes there on YouTube as well. And I want to get right into today's guest because this is a show I've been wanting to do for a long time. And I'm going to tell you the story of, of how I met Gary, first of all. The, the pandemic had some interesting side effects. And one of the interesting side effects of the pandemic was these photographer get-togethers that I know a number of people were doing. David Bergman was doing them. And that's where I've met actually a couple people I've ended up having on the show. William Snyder, who was the Stevie Ray Vaughan album cover photo. We had him on. I met him in David's get-togethers. And then the guy that I've got on today, Canadian photographer, but based out of New York. It's Gary Hershorn. Gary, how are you? I'm well, Steve. How about yourself? It's I'm wonderful, and it's good to see you again. Uh, we have met a number of times in these Zoom hangouts through the pandemic, which is kind of funny to me. I'm, I'm curious if you think the same thing, but it's actually, to me, a really amazing thing that came out of the pandemic is some of the people that I've met virtually. Oh, I agree. I, I never missed any of the ones that David Berkman did. You know, I was really honored to have been invo invited into all the uh, the chats that he had. And wow, we met some extraordinary photographers over the uh, the course of the last year or year and a half. I, I, I miss them. You know, I, you now know, that he's back on the road with I know. Uh, Luke Combs, I miss them. He's in, he's in Europe as we're recording this in Paris, I think. Uh, and I feel the same way. There was something about those get-togethers, and part of it was the the uh, the the wild variety of what people photographed. We had Pulitzer Prize winners like William in there. Right. We had photojournalists like yourself, music photographers like me or David, and Adam L. Macias used to be in there. Um, mm -hmm. We had you know television set photographers. It was just such a, a wonderful mix. Your your history when I when I first met you. What I did in these hangouts, right. and I would recommend anybody do this. Like if you're doing any of those type of, hey, let's do a virtual get together. When somebody new is in there while they're talking or whatever, look them up. Because mm -hmm. I looked up Gary and my my first impression of you was what you mostly shoot now. Right. I don't know how to describe what you shoot now that I think gives it the, the, the credibility that it deserves. How do you describe the stuff you're photographing now, the New York stuff? Well, it's it's basically a long term uh, project documenting New York City and the look of the skyline and the changing uh, look of the New York skyline. Um, it started in 2011 uh, for me back when I was working at Reuters. And and the reason it started in 2011 was because it was the 10th anniversary of 9-11. And that summer leading up to September 11th, you know, 2011, the, the world was looking for pictures in New York City. It was a big news story. What was going on in New York City 10 years after the fact? And, and really, you know, for 10 years, nothing was going on in New York City. You know, the city became stagnant in its uh, development of uh, new buildings. Um, they had no agreement whatsoever as to what to build in uh, lower Manhattan, where the uh, Twin Towers stood. They fought over the design of uh, the buildings. They fought over how to make a museum, how to design the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, memorials. You know, so uh, it took years and years and years for it to sort of uh, work its way through the bureaucracy of New York City. And, uh, and, and in the end, by, by the time 2000, the summer of 2011 came about, One World Trade Center started to come up on, out of the ground. And, and with the building of that building, there was like a reemergence of New York City on the world scene. And, and that's when I really jumped into starting to photograph what was going on in New York City. Okay. So I, I, I have to dive into that a little bit more. So first of all, let me just mm -hmm. be clear. This was a personal idea, a personal project. This was not an assignment for you. 
It was it was a little bit of both to start with. Uh, we certainly uh, at the time I was in charge of the uh, the, uh, the picture department at Reuters, and I had been assigning photographers all over the city to all over, I've been assigning Reuters photographers to go out all over New York to photograph uh, all all sorts of things in the city to show it off. And I, living on the Jersey side in Hoboken, New Jersey, uh, spent a lot of that summer riding my bike or walking up and down um, the Hudson River walkway and, and just photographing what was happening with lower Manhattan in the background. And, and that's really, you know, how it started. And like I say, you know, World Trade Center was one World Trade Center was starting to appear on the skyline. And, and I, I was having a glorious time with it. It was just a lot of fun uh, to to document something leading up to such an iconic uh, and memorable um, uh, anniversary. So, again, when when we first started talking about doing this, like the first time I met you, I said, actually, I think David said, you need to have him on the show. I'm like, yes, you're right. I do. <laughs> and in my head. It was going to be one of those shots because right. I, I don't know how to word this in a way that's going to make people understand. So I, I, I'm, I'm putting Gary's lower third up for Instagram and Twitter and stuff like that. But you really need to go look at his Instagram because when you see these New York shots, these are not normal shots. Like you have this ability to to compose a New York shot where like the one it's in the gallery, that's going to be in the blog post folks. Mm -hmm. If you go look at the one mm -hmm. I'm talking about with the balcony that jets out in front of the moon, right. Right. you have this, this ability to layer the New York skyline with right. either, either nature or meaning the moon uh, or light or other parts of the New York skyline in a way I honestly have never seen right. before. You've got a shot you and I have talked about privately before, and that is your mm -hmm. your rainbow that connects New Jersey to New York, your mm -hmm. your double rainbow shot, which is freaking amazing. Mm -hmm. But you mentioned Reuters. I want to I want to go back a little bit. Photojournalist for 43 years. We're talking the famous UPI, United Press International. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Where you were chief photographer for Canada. You went to Reuters from 85 to 2014 as a senior photographer, picture editor for the Americas and mm -hmm. uh, global sports pictures editor. Mm -hmm. Correct. 2014. So three years after this personal project, you leave Reuters. I leave and Reuters, yes. Since have been photo editor at Flipboard, Fox News, you're a Getty contributor still. And right. now you work for Facebook? I do. Um, I, um, uh, I work in the news curation group, uh, at Facebook and I, uh, help pick the stories in their news tab that, uh, uh, we think that people should be reading on a minute by minute basis. That to me is such a, an interesting transition from the photo journalism, journalism to this, although the news mm -hmm. makes sense. All of this led to a book. So for people that are interested in these New York skyline type shots, this, this 2011 personal project, uh, tell us about the book a little bit. Well, the book, um, the book came out of the, uh, the head of the publisher, Warren Winter at uh, PSG Wire. And, and he's the one that uh, decided that he wanted to uh, publish it. I knew Warren. Uh, Warren also published books by uh, David, David Bergman and Vincent Laforé and, and a, a number of photographers uh, in in the in the photo the news you know photography field kind of thing, and so it was really a, a, a good fit. You know, I knew of Nor I knew of Warren, and it was a really nice fit to collaborate with him. Um, it was his idea. He was the one that approached me with the idea of doing it. Uh, he came up with the idea of of doing a celestial type of uh, book, you know, or topic. Uh, so so all the pictures in the book have to do with the sun and the moon as opposed to just another picture book of nice pictures of New York City. So we tried to give it a theme and I was all in for it. I, I had plenty of content to put in the book and, and I think it worked out, uh, it worked out quite well. It's, it's interesting to look back on it. You know, I, I as a photographer, um, find flaws in the pictures. Uh, and when I say flaws, I mean, I see buildings that are incomplete in the pictures in the book because it was 2019. And when I look at them in 2022, you know, those buildings are finished. You know, I see holes on the skyline where there is no building, but there is now a building in those right. uh, in those gaps. So so it's it's kind of weird to look at the book. You know, I love the pictures, you know, and I love taking pictures, but I love taking pictures every day because I see things change every day on the skyline. And I want to make sure that I'm out there every day capturing those those the little minutia 
of what is happening. You know, it could be just another layer, another floor of windows, you know, on the on the glass facade, you know, or they call it the curtain wall of a building as it's being built. You know, um, I, I time some of my uh, photography uh, to to, you know, sorry, whenever there's a whenever there's a new building and the curtain wall hits the top floor. Uh, there's, there are changes because once the curtain wall is all the way to the top, the crane comes down, right? Once the building is enclosed, there's no reason to have a crane on the building anymore. Everything is inside. Everything has to come up the, uh, the freight elevator now. So, uh, so it's, it's, it's fun to watch the changes. And every day I go out there and I'll see something new. We have a, we have a new building that is like one floor away in, up in, the, in, in, in and around Hudson Yards. Right, you know, right now, this week, it's one floor away from finishing their new, the curtain wall. So, so I have a project, you know, to go out and I have to photograph the skyline again from various angles because this building's completed and, and it's a never ending, it's, it's never ending because there's always a building being finished well, or there's but always again, a building. It's not just know. that it's not, I don't know how to describe it to people. You're well, not you, just you, photographing New York. I mean, seriously, you, right. A, you're one of the most prolific photographers I know. You really honestly do shoot and post amazing work every day. And correct me if I'm wrong, I think you told me once you're not using like a crazy camera for these New York shots, correct? No, I'm, I'm using consumer gear, basically, um, you know, for a number of reasons. You know, uh, I'm using my main go-to camera is uh, the Canon M series mirrorless cameras. And, and I use that for a number of reasons. It's small, it's light, it produces a great file. And, and I also use a Canon PowerShot uh, G7X, which is a camera that's always in my pocket. I prefer to use these cameras over, say, using a, an iPhone or a, or a mobile phone camera. You know, it's, it's just better to have something shot on a camera. The, the, the quality of the file is just better, especially in lower light. But, um, you know, the, the M series camera allows me to use regular Canon EF lenses. And you basically, because it's a one inch sensor on these cameras, you get to basically double the focal length. So a lot of the pictures that I shoot are with a 600, uh, the equivalent of a 600 and an 800 millimeter lens, because I carry around a 300 F4 or a 400 5.6. So when I go out, I have a little backpack, I'll have the, a camera in it, and I'll have these uh, three and 400 millimeter lenses that become super telephoto lenses. So it's the, basically uh, a micro four thirds. Correct. That's, yeah, that's okay. absolutely what it is. You know, so, so with, with uh, a, I feel it gives me an mount. advantage, right? And and the other thing that I was going to mention is you use the right word in saying layering. Uh, I love that you catch that because I love the I love shooting in layers. I shoot from Jersey. I love pictures that have somebody in the foreground in New Jersey, in a different state with the city in the background. Um, you know, I like to I like to play with um, perspective a little bit by me being away from the skyline rather than being inside New York and photographing from in there. I think you have, uh, uh, you have limited, more limited options when you're inside the city and it's harder to show off the beauty of the city against the sky and the light without like looking up the city's nose, you know, well, when you're, when you're in it. Looking up the city's nose. If I named my episodes, yeah. that's the episode title right there. Looking up the city's <laughs> nose. You, uh, two things. A, that's a great tip that you can, by going to Jersey, you can get better New York shots. That's, that's a fantastic tip right there. But right. also the, you don't know how much better you make me feel realizing that that layering effect that you get, because it's pronounced, right? It's, it's not only pronounced, mm -hmm. it's brilliantly executed, which, uh, a lot of people layer, a lot of people use that landscape type idea of, you know, foreground, right. midground, background, and mm -hmm. okay, you got a foreground, mid ground, background, whatever, right? And then it's when it's done right, and you do it so well. I, I'm curious, I looking that. looking back at your 43 years, mm -hmm. yep. how has photojournalism changed? Uh, it's, it's you know what the taking of the pictures has not changed. I was just the last night I was having a long conversation about this. You know, when I started out in 1977. Um, uh, starting to take pictures. My professional career started in 1978, 79. Um, it was still about going out and getting the best picture. 
you know, everybody who, who goes out and photographs just wants to get the best picture. The, the way it's changed is how uh, photographers are under pressure to get more than just the single best picture. You know, the Internet has opened up the ability to publish, you know, you know, 20 picture galleries, you know, on a new site. So right. so when you go out and cover an event, when I went out and covered an event back in the 60s or 60s in the uh, in the 70s, in the 80s, you were looking for one best that's what we called it, one best, you know, because that's all there was. There was only room, you know, to put one picture from an event in a newspaper. And, and that's really all there was or a magazine. So so now it's not it's, it is expanded out from being one best to being a multiple number of of pictures. And, and the other thing that's changed in how you shoot is is photography now. News photography now is more artistic. You know, I think photo editors and, and news publications like to have a little more interpretive feel to how the image is, uh, is shot. You know, I, I used to go out and say, you know, a standard lens back in the, in the day was a 50. You shot everything on a 50 or a 35. And I always used to joke that my 50 millimeter lens was a 400 because I always like to stand back, shoot longer and, and shoot tighter. And, and, and I, that was the style that worked very well for me for, uh, you know, decades. And then all of a sudden, I think the whole, the whole feel of news photography and photojournalism changed to a more wider view. Um, my view was cut out the world and concentrate on the subject, kind of like a portrait, you know, that, that is just a headshot of somebody. And I was kind of doing that in, in news pictures. And, and at some point I realized that I was cutting out elements that shouldn't have been cut out. And, and I was, um, one, of my, one of my mentors is uh, Steve Fine, and he was uh, the director of photography at Sports Illustrated for, uh, you know, 25 years. And, and his mon mantra was time and place. Everything about a photograph to be iconic and classic was time and place. If you looked at the photograph, say it was a, a, it was at a, a a sporting event, did it have the clock in it? Did you know what time or what quarter or what period that picture was taken? You know, and and does it have an element of place? If you're if you're photographing a tennis uh, match at Wimbledon, you leave the grass in. You can go wider and leave the grass in because it's on grass. It's unique. And, and so that is an element of time and place. And the other word that, that Steve used a lot to, to teach me was uh, context. And, and does your picture you know, tell the story in a way that the viewer will, will see everything about the, the, the event that you're photographing? The stadium, where it was, was it day, was it night? You know, was it in what quarter, what period? You know, what part of the game was, uh, was this picture shot at? And uh, I, I didn't used to do that, you know, and as a wire service photographer, we never we never thought of time and place and context. We just thought of using the longest lens to blur the background, to isolate the action and make it stand out. And, and you know, you would get that winning goal or that winning you know, touchdown. And it was uh, very much isolated action and it looked great. And when I shot, I, I always looked for the black background. You know, I didn't want fans in the background. I wanted the black background. Back then, we didn't deal with advertising. There wasn't, the, you know, advertising on the boards like there is now in hockey, right. for example. Right. So I, I was always looking for the cleanest background. I shot all my sports at 2.8. So I could uh, blur the background as much. I you know, used the longest lens possible. But I realized, you know, after many discussions with Steve, I realized that that I was doing something that was good for the wire, but it wasn't telling the complete story. And if you ever go back and look at the, uh, the greatest images from Sports Illustrated, you will always see that they had um, time, place, and context in almost every one of their, their magical moments. Wow. So it, that, that's such a weird, a weird switch from – so first of all, that, that statement is, is powerful that Steve told you, right? Time, place, right. et cetera. But – it's interesting to me because as a photographer, you were making a creative choice, which Correct. effectively is what we are. I would argue you just defined why photo, uh, photo editors exist because they can look at what the magazine needs, what the photographer is capable of doing and find that meeting mm -hmm. place and be able to put it into words, which is great. But 
contrast that with when I had Scott Kelby on. And one of Scott Kelby's things is he wants his photos to be, and I've had multiple photographers use this phrase, timeless. So when he mm -hmm. shot uh, cable cars in Portugal, he specifically didn't want to see anything that was modern. Right. Because he wanted the picture to be timeless. Totally different goal, right? It's always about goals. Um, yeah, just amazing. I, I want to get into that, the shot that we're going to. That, that's that the word that I should have. That's the word that I should have used when describing uh, the book. Uh, I have said time and time and time again that the pictures that I shoot are not timeless. I, I, have, I, I preach that endlessly. My pictures are not timeless. So when I look at pictures that I have in a book that were published in 2019, um, I, I see something that's older. That skyline could be 1930. You know, uh, you know it, because the skyline in 2022 was much different. So, so uh, other than shooting a single image, sorry, other than shooting an image that singularly shows the Statue of Liberty, there's no possible way to shoot a timeless picture in New York City because the city changes so drastically from week to week. That's a good point. I mean, theoretically right now, if you took a picture of Times Square and if they didn't change Times Square in the next 30 years, it's a timeless photo. Right. And yet it's nothing like Times Square in 1972. Correct. That's that's yeah. correct. And yeah. and so um, uh, the, the other thing I wanted to say was I have basically applied all that all those ideas of of time and place to my New York pictures. You know, you can go out and just shoot a picture of New York. And 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 in, in many cases, it could be Pittsburgh. It could be Chicago. It could be anywhere. You you have to shoot a picture of New York that includes the iconic uh, structures that exist in this city. Otherwise, it's not New York, right? If, if you have pictures that don't have, you know, and there's like, you know, eight to 12 iconic, recognizable landmarks, you know, and we're lucky in New York to have so many, whether it's the Statue of Liberty or One World Trade Center or the skyline of Lower Manhattan or the Brooklyn Bridge, the Chrysler Building, Empire State Building, Hudson Yards now, Billionaire's Row. These are iconic structures that have uh, been cemented into the minds of, of people all over the world. And anybody right. who comes to New York never forgets the look of the city and the look of these buildings. So well, I, I have to include those. There's got to be something in the background that instantly says New York City or the picture doesn't work. And that's right. part of the layering and part of the, the, the time and context, sorry, you know, time, place, context, and all that, you know, always, it doesn't have to be big. It's just got to be there to identify it as New York City. So to everybody, you need to go look at Gary's uh, Instagram and his website. And if you're watching the video, either on YouTube or in the podcast feed, make sure that you follow the links. But if you go to the website, behindtheshot.tv, you will find all the links we're talking about, all his links to uh, uh, social media, his website, the book, all of that. And just a reminder for you, the, the podcast itself is available in your podcast app of choice in audio only, or if your podcast app of choice supports video like Apple Podcast does, you can also get the video there. And of course, the video is also up on YouTube. If you do watch it on YouTube, please head down, hit the subscribe and the like button. It would be much appreciated. I also want to remind you that the high def video that you're seeing, that is courtesy of my friends at DVE Store. Visit dvestore.com for your digital video equipment needs. And one last thing I want to mention, and some of you have already heard this before, and I've, I've done workshops for Princeton Photo Workshop before, but I do have another one coming up. At the time we're recording this, uh, this is early April, uh, excuse me, early March at this point. The workshop is in April. So if you go to PrincetonPhotoWorkshop.com, you can find my action workshop. And it's basically using my, my fight and sports and, and music photography as examples in action, low light action photography. So head on over there if you want to know more information about the workshops. Again, it's PrincetonPhotoWorkshop.com. And that brings us to the picture for today. So for the picture for today, I, I introduce this as being what I would call one of your most iconic pictures. And I think it's one of your most iconic pictures on a number of levels. Again, we're going to get into layers here. I, I need to name sure. this episode differently. Because on, on one layer, this is one of your most iconic pictures because of the subject matter, right? On another, it's one of your most iconic pictures because of how it's composed, the timing. It, it, it's it's everything you just mentioned, right? And this is the U.S. Democratic presidential nominee, Senator at the time, Barack Obama, during the election night rally in Chicago. It's November 4th, 2008. And there is so much about this image that I would argue 
And it's going to be interesting to talk to you about this because not only are you a good sure. photographer, but you're a photo editor at a level that most people will never even get to talk to, let alone meet, you know, mm -hmm. Reuters, UPI, et cetera. This image is everything that a photojournalistic image should be, to me, right. at least. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely everything. So before we get into the description of the shot, let me just, and, and I, I'm not sure if you've got this in your head, but I'm, I'm going to read off what the EXIF data says. Tell me if it sounds about right. So exposure sure. mode would be shutter priority. Do you usually shoot shutter priority when you shoot a shot like this? Uh, I, I, uh, I don't usually shoot shutter. I almost always shoot manual. Uh, I would all, you know, back then I was shooting everything manual, but this was a camera. This was a remote camera. It was attached okay. to the background of the stage. So you had to shoot in, in automatic mode. Why shutter priority and not aperture priority? Just just to make sure that it it, it, it had a shutter speed fast enough to, to capture movement. Okay. And it looks like, again, according to EXIF data, it, it was 1 250th of a second, f2.8. Mm -hmm. This is 16 millimeters on a 16 to 35, Canon 16 to 35, which is a right. brilliant lens. I love that lens. And you shot this on right. a Canon 5D, so this is also super high res. Right, Correct. Uh, or no, it's not the 5D. So, uh, what you, 5D? It, it was just yeah, a regular, regular 5D. Re regular 5D. So strike what I just said. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm it might have been a Mark II or three. I, okay. I, you know, depending on the year, I don't know. Yeah, 2008. So, so many questions here. Number one, I want to touch on before I describe it. In every show, I describe the shot for those that are on the audio feed. Mm -hmm. It's always fun to attempt. I I recommend everybody right. try and describe their own shots verbally to somebody as though they couldn't see it because you'll find the flaws and the the strong points of your shot. But remote camera at an event like this, did right. did all the wire services, were they all allowed to get there early and wire up cameras at the top? Or was this something you yes. got to do different? No, no, no. This is, um, this is all the wire services. Uh, every one of us, AP, Reuters, AFP, Getty, EPA, you know, there, there's six to eight, you know, uh, cameras or news organizations that were probably allowed to put cameras up uh, on the back of the stage. Um, and, and it is, uh, there's a hierarchy as to who can do it. Um, it basically follows the White House hierarchy of, uh, you know, you know, like, like, you know, naming the, the major agencies and maybe the New York Times or the Washington Post, some of the bigger newspapers. Uh, but we were we were all allowed to put one camera. Those of us who were allowed to put a camera up on the back of the stage were allowed to put one camera. Because how, there was early, only so much room. How early did you have to get there to do that? We did the we did the camera placement the day before. Okay. And, and this is outdoors. This uh, was outdoors in, uh, in the park there. Yeah. How did you, so let's, let's talk technical on that before so, we even get into the shot for okay. a second. You're mounting a okay, remote yes. camera, which a lot of people have not done. I've had conversations with David and my, my buddy El Micaias about this too, because I right. don't do remote cameras usually. And I'd love to, right. I just, a lot of times I'm at a show where I can, right? Right. How are you connecting it? How are you triggering it? So uh, they put up a bar at the back of the stage. You know, it was like a white background to the stage or, or whatever, you know, whatever it is, maybe blue background. Um, and above the top, they put a bar for Like us. a piece of trust. The, uh, yeah, exactly. They, they are very good and savvy, the advanced people that work on campaigns and, and the people that work at the White House. They, they know the picture angles. They know what will work well. And so they put up a truss or a bar for us to, to physically attach uh, a camera to. It was a clamp and a ball head, that's all, and a camera. You know, clamber on the ball head, ball head on a clamp. Clamp, you know, attaches to the truss, and that's it, right? And um, it was, uh, you know, I had my one camera. Uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe AP got to put theirs up first because there's a hierarchy, and then Reuters second, and then AFP third, and Getty fourth, and, you know. So as each agency puts a camera, they're going a little farther off center, right? So you can, basically get, okay. a, you can get basically get a couple of cameras perfectly centered, AP and Reuters. We were the, usually the top two on the hierarchy. How did you trigger uh, so, it, though? It was triggered with a pocket wizard. It was a radio remote. So there was a receiver on the camera and there is um, a, a trigger. 
that you would fire. And, and the interesting thing about this picture that we can get into a little bit later, I'm in this picture. So um, uh, I'm actually in it inside that tent. And so you can see the distance by which I was triggering the camera from. You know, in, in that tent on the very left, if you look straight into the tent, there's one body against a white wall on the very left of the, uh, of the tent. Off just to wow. the, almost where the tent ends. Uh, that's me. And, and that's the distance by which I was firing this radio remote. D did I know if it was going to work or not? Who knew? You know, it could very well have not fired with all the uh, interference that is in the air when you have all those TV networks and their wireless uh, equipment. Uh, in many arenas that we've done this in, the uh, radio remotes don't necessarily work that well. Where, where, where I set, when I set up remotes, I always try to have a hard wire to the remote. That's, that's the perfect world. I can step on a foot pedal and the camera, I know the camera is going to fire. So it was, right. uh, it was, there, there was no other way to do it. You had to use uh, a wireless remote. Well, I'm glad and it went off because, me too. again, this shot. So let me do this. So, For those of you that so are on I'll, the audio, say again. Yep. No, no, I, I, I don't know if we're at this point yet on how, to, how, how I decided to frame it this way or how I decided to shoot this picture versus what everybody else shot. Is, is well, let me, let me describe story. it first so okay. that people know what they're looking at if they're listening to, or know what they're listening at <laughs> if they're on audio. And, and sure. then we'll get into that description because when I say that this thing is everything that I want – in a photojournalistic image. Let me explain why, and I'm going to get into the layering. And, it, and, and the composition, the lens choice, even though you're with other cameras, that all matters here greatly. So let's, let's start in the far back because this is key. This is really a photo of the Chicago skyline. That's really what it is. The Chicago skyline is clearly seen in the background. You can even tell what, yes. they, it's a different name now, but you can see Sears Tower, as it used to be called, in the back right. It's identifiable as Chicago, which a lot of people might have shot this tighter, even with a remote camera. In front of the Chicago skyline, you have a row of trees. Now, you can't see the full row of trees because there is a large white tent there. I'll get to that in just a second. But there is a row of trees, and you can see it below the Sears Tower, right-hand side of the frame. Uh, works perfect. Next up is this large white tent. Now, what I want you to think is not an easy up type tent. It's the type of tent they put up temporarily white with, you know, big metal poles inside. And that's a three-sided tent. There are sides, there's a back, but the front is open. And that's where all the media is. You can see all the media lighting, the cameras, uh, television cameras. It's very clear what's happening in there. But here's what's interesting. Even though you see that, you know what this is immediately based on other things I'll get to. You know that's media in there. Mm -hmm. The left-hand side so smartly includes a row of smaller tents that have names on them. Like smaller, almost, they're not easy ups, but they're smaller tents. So you can see one of them says CNN. So based on that big easy up, based on the skyline, you know, at Chicago, based on the trees, you know, you're outdoors and in a park of some sort, you see the easy up with all the lights, you know, it's a large media event. You see on the left-hand side, it's a really large media event because it's not local. You see CNN and you see a whole row of other media tents lined up on the, the left. And then behind or between the stage and that big media tent, you have an entirely huge, large crowd of people. And then at the bottom of the frame, you have the stage. So starting at the front, stage, people, tent, trees, skyline. Amazing layering going on here. But the stage, mm. first of all, is blue. That makes it stand out. Your composition is spot on in that. The stage itself, the stage proper, the primary landing spot of the stage, is exactly at the lower rule of third. It fills the lower third of the frame. The people fill the middle third of the frame. And then the mm -hmm. skyline is the top third of the frame. My God, man. On this stage, there's an, what they call an apron, which is like a peninsula that shoots out into the crowd. Mm -hmm. And what makes this shot is this overhead point of view. It's back up. It's high, like Gary said. But he managed to keep in the American flag on the stage on the right. There's two other flags, and you know they're flagpoles, even though you don't see the flags, because it's the eagles 
on the top of mm -hmm. the flags. Yes. Leaving the main stage and just entering the apron, that peninsula, are the Obamas and their two kids. On the left-hand side, it's Michelle holding Malia's hand, then a small gap. And then it's Sasha holding Barack's hand. Mm -hmm. And they're lit by all of these lights. There's, by the way, around the Big Easy up in the back, there are light towers with people with spotlights. Mm -hmm. They're completely backlit, silhouetted, but they're not totally silhouetted. You can see detail. Their shadows run perfectly straight at the camera. Did I miss anything? No, you described it in its entirety. It's, this is, you, Jack Resnicki could take this into his photography business class in New York and use this as an example of, okay, this is what you're aiming for. Right. So let's start with what you started to, to talk about before. Tell me, you know, how you ended up with this assignment and, and some of the details about this shot. Well, uh, I ended up with the assignment because I was the boss. <laughs> Okay, I was in charge of the photo department. This was the big global story, you know, Barack Obama winning the, the presidency. And I, 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 I was there, you know, as the, the photo editor for the United States and the Americas. Um, I was there. This was the big event. That's what, that's what you know, the, the person in charge of the department does. You go to the big events and you run the event. And, and I uh, chose to set up the remote camera. I wanted to set up the remote camera so badly, you know, that I, I, I just, I gave it to myself. You know, I, I, I knew I had the expertise to set it up, to how to use the remotes, how to set the camera up. You can't miss, right? You can't fail. It's got to work. So I took all that, you know, responsibility and pressure on myself and, and, want, and I really, truly wanted to shoot this remote camera. And, and the picture came in my mind, out of the Democratic convention that was held in Denver in August uh, 2008. And in that convention, you know, normally on the night that the candidate speaks, Thursday night at the convention, um, it's usually inside a, an arena. They almost, they almost always do the, um, the conventions at hockey arenas or basketball arenas, right? But it, that year in Denver, the Democratic Party threw a curveball at everybody and they did the Thursday night acceptance speech in the football stadium where the Broncos play. And they wanted a bigger crowd, obviously. So um, I was not at the convention itself. I was um, back in New York. Uh, at, at that point, we were using some remote editing software. So I was actually editing the convention remotely from New York City, from, uh, from the office in New York City. And um, I noticed when, when the Obamas walked out for their acceptance speech on that night, this is the exact lighting that they used in Denver. And I kept that in the back of my head from August to November, thinking that what's the chance that they're going to light it exactly the same way in, in, on election night in, in Chicago? And, you know, that night in Denver, there, I, I saw it on TV and I honestly can't remember if anybody actually photographed it this way, with, like with a remote camera wide, you know, I'm not sure anybody knew that the lighting would throw the shadows, but I, I, I saw it somewhere. I think it was on a TV. I think it was on the TV broadcast on a wider behind the, the stage, uh, you know, shot on TV. And, and I, I saw that. And uh, I thought, well, what's the chances? You know, maybe they'll do the same thing. Maybe they'll do the same thing uh, on election night. So I had one camera that I could set up and I chose to set it up to capture that scene, not knowing if the lighting would create it. That was you a did a, a Hail shoot. Mary. Wait a minute. That's you a, did a Hail Mary on this? On that, Right. All the other, all the other photographers, the other cameras, sorry, the other cameras that were set up all had uh, 70 to 200 millimeter lenses on them. If you, if you look at the front of the stage, you can see the podium where, where uh, uh, Obama gave his acceptance speech. And um, all the other photographers set up their cameras to capture 
the end of the speech when the family walks out and he um, waves after giving the speech, right? So they wanted the, the row of, of people in front of the stage and him at the podium waving, waving with the family. And, and it, you know what? It was a pretty picture. It really, you know, everybody else had a very nice picture of that that I didn't have, you know, from back there. But nobody else had this. I think I was the only one that set up the camera with the wide angle lens, hoping that they lit the stage exactly like they did at the uh, convention. Wow. Okay. So, oh man, you. It's a Hail Mary, right? I could I could have gone the easy route and and shot the the longer lens to make the obvious photo. Except, except, you would then have the same shot as everybody else. He's Correct. still backlit, right? So. Correct. A, a singular shadow of somebody with audience, I'm sorry, is not as powerful as what What were the three again? Time, context, right? Place. What was the other one? Sense of place. Sense of Sense place. Sense of place. This is all three of those. Now, what's interesting to me is, so you set this up at Shutter Priority. You didn't know if it was going to light this. Now, this makes more sense to me. You didn't know what the lighting was going to be. Right. Uh, be. Correct. You had a trigger, but of course, what you've got to set up the exposure of this camera. And you sent me the original shot, and the original shot is definitely under underexposed. So that's the original yeah. shot. That's the finished shot. Um, did you, because you didn't know if this was going to be the same lighting, did you intentionally, not knowing how bright they were going to be? say to yourself, I'm going to go under because I know I can recover and I don't want to lose any detail if it, if they go way brighter than I expect. Was that conscious right. of you? Absolutely. Under is better than over. So every time. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And this is, by the way, this is tough lighting. This is tough lighting if the camera's in your freaking hands. Right. Uh, Absolutely. Again, you know, uh, for photojournalism, this is he completely backlit the whole family. You had to time it. Again, your timing here, by the way, is impeccable because the fact that they're not on the stage and the fact that they're not too far down the apron, the fact that they are just encroaching, just getting into the apron mm -hmm. right at the line of the rule of thirds. Compositionally, this is so, so, so well done. So as you're composing it with 16 millimeter and you know that you want to get all of this, right? And you know mm -hmm. in your head you don't want that 70 to 200 shot. Were you, however, and you can lie to me if you want to, were you, were you aware of the skyline and the easy ups on the left with CNN and the crowd position and the spotlight tower position? Were you in your head as you were setting it up? Were you aware of that or was it you clamped it and walked away? Um, I wasn't aware of that at all because it was set up in the daylight, not at night. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. Because even was set up... Uh, it was set up in an afternoon, the, the afternoon before. Because even if you uh, look at this original shot, you could not have nailed that better. Right, right. Absolutely. Um, so, no, I was not aware of how it was going to look at night because um, when the camera was uh, set up and I framed it and, and positioned it and clamped it down and locked out everything down, it was, um, it was all in the daylight, in the sun. And so it was a completely different look. Um, I was uh, I was um, composing 100% for the shadows. I wasn't paying any attention to the tent or the the uh, uh, network uh, tents, you know, which was their live shots uh, where their anchors were. Uh, I wasn't paying any attention to that whatsoever, uh, because you just oh. couldn't you couldn't you couldn't visualize that on on the on the 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 night of of this happening they did let us uh, go up and 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 put our batteries or, or turn the camera on right um probably it was like four or five o'clock in the afternoon when we could uh, they we had a ladder we had to go up on a ladder you know just just you could take one last look to make sure the camera hadn't been moved and um uh, stick the battery in turn the camera on and and make sure you're on the right frequency for your wire, uh, your, your wireless remote. And that was it. And then, you know, hope that the camera fired, you know, this was what, 11 o'clock at night, somewhere around there. And yeah, yeah. we were, uh, we were doing a last check, you know, probably in the daylight also. Arguably that now that you're saying the shadows, arguably that is the brilliance of the shot because 
you could have based on that 16 millimeter and just look, I want to get this. You could have had those less easy ups, more easy ups, less building skyline, more less sky above. Yeah. yeah. But if the heads in those shadows were cut off, right, that would kill the shot. That would kill it. You didn't know how long those shadows were going to be. And yet you got the heads of the shadows and that right. is because that's the people you see. You see more detail in the hands up in the shadows on the stage than you do in the hands up on the actual people. Since this was digital, when mm -hmm. you get this back, what did you use? What software do you use to cull and process your pictures? Or for that matter, I guess, did somebody at Reuters do it for you? Yeah, uh, I had a photo editor there, a um, guy named Peter Jones. Uh, he was the one that edited this. And uh, I remember, I, I remember, um, you know, uh, the night ended. The, the last thing we were able to do was to go back up on stage and, uh, and, and retrieve the cameras off the backboard. Uh, so it might have been uh, 45 minutes after the event ended. You know, by the time we uh, had the opportunity to get back up on the stage, get back, get out the ladder and get up on the backboard and uh, to, to retrieve the camera and the disc. And, and um, I, I knew I had it. I mean, well, it's digital, right? So I immediately looked at the back of the camera and I could see that I had it. You know, the, the heads weren't cut off in the shadow and the exposure was workable. And, and so I was quite happy. And then I, you know, gave the disc to uh, the editor. And uh, we brought it up on uh, the computer. We just used Photoshop to crop okay. and uh, the crop. And, and it was like almost full frame, this picture. There's very little to crop out of it. It's, uh, it's interesting. Bit. You got to be honest. There was a moment as you were climbing that ladder, you were holding your breath, right? Absolutely. No question. <laughs> I had no idea if it fired. <laughs> you know, I have no idea whatsoever. Is there, you is know, there anything oh. you'd do differently today? Uh, no, no, nothing at all. Nothing at all. You know, the, the, I did know I did know before this when I did some test shots, it was firing because there's a red light, you know, um, that goes off or something. I don't know if it's on the pocket wizard or the front of the camera, but I, I could look through a 400 millimeter lens, you know, from where I was standing in the tent back there and, and see my camera and push the button on the, the pocket wizard and see a red light go off. So I knew it was firing, but but when you that's one thing. But when you get to the moment and every network is running their camera and all their wireless and microwave equipment at the same time, which they're not all doing necessarily when I'm doing my tests. Right. Um, you know, with nobody on stage, they're not, they're not, they're not, you know, all cranked up and, and, and aiming in the same direction, you know, that, uh, that I am. Um, uh, you don't know, you don't know, you push the button, you just keep pushing the button and hoping that it's going off. What a lesson, man. Amazing. Okay. You know, so first of all, I, I honestly believe this is this is a study, could be a study in photojournalism, not just the fact of the composition you ended up with, but the process that you went through to get it, uh, mm -hmm. I think is just, again, I've told you before what I think about your photography. I'll tell you again, it's just really amazing shot. So let's move on. Thank you. First of all, before I do move on, was there anything you wanted to add about this shot? No, no, I, I, I think you, uh, you covered it well. Um, the, the, uh, the camera was set up and the composition was all about the shadows. Uh, lucky us, we had the flag, you know, or lucky me, I had the flag in the, in the right side of the frame to, uh, to further add to the feeling of a presidential election. And, I was just going to uh, say, the just, people with the 70 to 200, they right. lost context. Context, correct. They, they completely, and, and I will... I, I kid you not, I will shoot differently now based on that thought. I, I think I always think that in the back of my head, but I'm also like you. I like the black backgrounds. I like subject separation, blah, blah, blah. But environment matters at times. So let's move on to it a speed does. round. On the speed round, I've got a couple of questions for you. Answer them as fast as you want. Okay. Right? Okay. They, they can be a sentence, whatever. What's the one main tip that you would give people for better photojournalistic images? Uh, pre-plan your, in, in, in many cases, pre-plan your shot. Know what you want to capture and put yourself in a place to get it. Okay. How can people, and this is a big one for a lot of people that want to get in front of photo editors, whether it be with a newspaper, a Rolling Stone for music photography, which is mm -hmm. Sasha Lecca. Um, mm -hmm. What can people do 
to get the attention of photo editors? I, I think you need to have a strong presence on social media uh, and, and somehow try to get word to these photo editors to look at what you do. You don't necessarily have to send them your portfolio like in the old days. Your, your social media accounts should be your portfolio in today's world and, and make sure it's uh, up to speed and it's good and it doesn't have pictures of your dogs or kids and things like that. If you're a professional, you want a professional looking social media presence and, and you know, do what you can to get word to uh, a photo editor to take a peek at what you're doing. Okay. Favorite composition rule if you have one? Layers. You know, try to layer without without question. Um, if you look at if you look at uh, almost every picture that I post, there's an element of layering in it, and I think that's just uh, uh, that's just uh, my rule for composition. That's your superpower. I'm just going to tell you right now is is the way yeah, you layer. Thank you. So, next one is you told me once that the way you're timing the moon and everything else with the Statue of Liberty torch and everything is there's a specific app that you use. What's your Correct. favorite app that you use for photography? Um, well, there, there's three, you know, my favorite one without a doubt is, is an app called planet pro okay. and it is the ultimate app, uh, uh, for aligning the, uh, sun and the moon with, uh, buildings in, in, in anywhere, in, like, like in New York city, for example. Um, if I want to take a picture of the, the moon, a full moon rising in front of the Statue of Liberty, and I want to place it exactly behind the um, uh, the torch of the Statue of Liberty with a full moon behind the torch. This app will tell me where to stand at what time, and and it's it's bang on. You never miss. And it, whether you want it at the top of the Empire State Building or behind the Chrysler Building or whatever, uh, okay. these 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 um, apps that uh, position you in the right place uh, are are you, you have to have it. You must have it. I also use a weather app, a professional weather app that is um, uh, that allows me to see weather patterns. I can see the storms coming in if I want to go capture lightning. If I'm interested in a potential rainbow, I can almost predict a rainbow with the help of the the, the professional weather app that shows me in real time the, the what, movement what's the name and of the it? speed. Um, Radar Storm. Okay. And uh, the third app that I use is just EarthCam webcams. And it allows me, you know, there, there are 15 or 20 live webcams around New York City. And the, um, you can buy the app, you, you pay five bucks, you know, and you get all, you get access to all the, uh, the webcams. And it allows me to um, look at the sky. It allows me to, to see what's happening at sunrise and at sunset without even leaving my house or leaving the bed in the morning. And I can make decisions based on, on, on the webcams and how the sky and the color is forming to decide whether I get up and actually go out. So, so between all three apps, it, it, it narrows down the amount of time that you need to spend in actually photographing. You know, I'm one of those photographers who don't like, I don't like to go out and photograph for eight hours. I like to go out and photograph for eight minutes. And, and that's a fact. I think everybody who knows me knows that. I like to minimize the amount of time I'm out there actually shooting, which is great in the winter. You know, not as much, you know, I like to be outside, you know, in the summer, it's great to be outside longer when it's warm, but when it's 20 below zero and you're trying to get a picture of the moon rising at 5 a.m., you know, you won't, you only want to be out there for five minutes and all the apps help you minimize the amount of time that you need to actually be in the spot that you want to photograph. You lost, you lost me at 5 a.m., but that's okay. Uh, (laughs) Favorite, favorite album, song, or artist? Favorite album, song? Well, um, I'd have to say uh, uh, U2 is, okay. uh, is at the high of my list. And uh, Octoon Baby was, uh, you know, as good as an album gets, I think. Favorite drink? Um, water. I don't drink, so water. Makes sense to me. And last but not least, is there a photographer? Any photographer out there working today or amateur, whatever, that you think more people should know about? Oh, there's always photographers uh, out there that um, are on, you know, that are that are on Instagram or, you know, you know, um, who, are, who are out there, you know, shooting great pictures, but people haven't found them. Yes, of course. Um, I have an old friend. Um, uh, I have, uh, well, two friends. Um, one guy is, is, an, is, is a 
a photographer that had a long distinguished career. Uh, his name's Andy Sharp. And, and he was a, a photographer, I think, in Atlanta. And he's now covering Texas. He does what I do, but in, in the back roads of Texas, producing every single day the most exquisite imagery of rural America. You know, I shoot urban America. And, and I'm drawn also to another photographer that I work with at United Press, Andy Clark, who's up in Canada. He lives out on Vancouver Island in the in, basically in the middle of nowhere, right? He worked in Vancouver for many, many, many years. He was the prime minister's photographer, prime minister Mulroney in Canada for many years. Um, but Andy is now like Andy Sharp in Texas, covering rural Canada. So I find a great justice juxtaposition of looking at their work and comparing it to mine and wanting to do a book with either one of them or both of them of, of urban landscapes that I do and their rural landscapes of America and Canada that are absolutely exquisite. At, we'll call uh, them, we'll call them the Andes. And, the Andes. Yes. Yeah. The, the Andes links to both the Andes will be in the show notes. All of Gary's links will be in the show notes and I've been putting them up on video, but for those of you on audio, uh, what's your website? GaryHershorn.com. Okay. And Twitter and Instagram, you're Gary Hershorn, H-E-R-S-H-O-R-N. Uh, Correct. Gary, I am so glad that we finally got this going. I, I appreciate your time and your knowledge you. and everything that you share. I, I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for asking. It's been a pleasure. Make sure you head to the website, BehindTheShot.tv. You can find all the links. I'll have the photographer picks, the app picks, everything I can find. I'll put a link for in the show notes at BehindTheShot.tv. Again, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, people do say to me periodically, they hear it on YouTube and they say, where do I find them? All you got to do is go down below the subscribe and the like button, hit those on your way down. And in the description of the video, I include all the links down there as well. So once again, Thank you to my guest this time around, Gary Hershorn. Absolutely a joy to have you on. Make sure that you join us next time as we take a look inside the mind of a great photographer by taking a closer look behind the shot. 